One of the more popular stories in our Notre Dame Stories collection is called What's in a Name? It's about how Notre Dame got its nickname, the Fighting Irish. The story often gets attention when the debate over the mascots of other sports teams resurfaces. We asked Breen O'Connor, a professor of Irish language and literature, to read the story for us. As the Notre Dame football team prepares to play Navy at Aviva Stadium in Dublin, it's a good time to explore how the school got its nickname. How did a university, founded in a northern Indiana wilderness by a French priest, become the Fighting Irish? One theory traces back to Irish freedom fighter Eamon de Valera, who came to America in 1919 to gather money and hearts to his cause. His first stop was Boston's Fenway Park, where a political rally of nearly 60,000 people still holds the stadium's all-time attendance record. De Valera had been part of the 1916 Easter Rising and was imprisoned and sentenced to death. He was given amnesty, elected to Parliament and arrested by the English again. He escaped and slipped off to America to avoid recapture. Barnstorming the country, the future President of Ireland was welcomed as a hero at Notre Dame on October 15, 1919. A student publication indicated that his visit tilted campus opinion in favour of the Fighting Irish moniker, though not completely. De Valera planted a tree of liberty as a memorial of his visit. A week later, the tree was uprooted and thrown in one of the campus's lakes by a student of the Unionist persuasion. That's one story anyway. Actually, no one really knows for sure how Notre Dame became universally linked with the Irish. All we have is conjecture. But that's the Irish way, isn't it? Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. It's true that four of the six religious who founded Notre Dame in 1842 with French priest Edward Soren were Irish. It's true that nearly all of Father Soren's successors as university presidents claim Irish descent. And it's true that the student body has always had a strong Irish presence. The Fighting Irish nickname was first kind for the Irish immigrant soldiers who fought for the Union during the Civil War. One group was called the Irish Brigade, including three regiments from New York. Their valour was later memorialised in the poetry of Joyce Kilmer. That's also the Irish way, because Ireland's poetry is often better than its military might, turning defeat into eternal glory. The university has a valid claim to the nickname because the brigade's beloved chaplain was Father William Corby. Corby later became the third president of Notre Dame. The first use of the nickname Fighting Irish for Notre Dame sports teams may have been in 1909. Legend says that a player's speech at the halftime of a football game against Michigan inspired a furious comeback. He reportedly yelled to his teammates, players with names like Dolan, Kelly, Glenn and Ryan, what's the matter with you guys? You're all Irish and you're not fighting worth a lick. The news reports that picked up the story attributed the victory to the fighting Irishman. Historian and author Murray Sperber claims that the most widely accepted explanation of how the nickname settled on Notre Dame sports teams is more gradual but still dramatic. During the 1910s and 1920s, stereotypes and ethnic slurs were openly expressed against immigrants, Catholics and the Irish. The press often referred to Notre Dame teams as the Catholics, or worse, the Papists or Dirty Irish, because the school was largely populated by ethnic Catholic immigrants, many of them Irish. University leaders bristled at such descriptions. School publications called the team the Gold and Blue, or the Notre Dameers. This was also the Newt Rockney era, when the Notre Dame football team first put the small private school on the national map. Rockney's teams were often called the Rovers or the Ramblers because they travelled far and wide. 
This was an uncommon practice before the advent of commercial airlines. These names were also an insult to the school, meant to suggest it was more focused on football than academics. Rockney may have been Norwegian, but he had the Irish flair for storytelling and drama. A natural salesman, he hired student press agents to tell the team's story. Some of them began using the Fighting Irish nickname to characterise the underdog tenacity of his teams. They found a way to turn the rice of taunt with its suggestion of drunken brawling into an expression of triumph. Some students came to cherish the nickname. By owning the epithet, they transformed it into a symbol of pride. In the 1960s, the same process would be repeated for the leprechaun, which had traditionally been an English caricature of the Irish. Now it's the team mascot. Still, the nickname Fighting Irish was embraced by some and opposed by others by the time de Valera visited Fenway and Notre Dame. In a 1919 scholastic issue, a letter appeared from an alumnus who criticised the nickname because many players were not of Irish descent. Others rushed to defend the phrase, with one alum writing, you don't have to be from Ireland to be Irish. In the early 1920s, the press began to pick up the fighting Irish nickname to characterise the never-say-die spirit of Rockney's teams. One of Rockney's former press agents, Francis Wallace, popularised the term when he became a columnist for the New York Daily News. A little-known event occurring in 1924 may have inadvertently contributed to fighting Irish lore. Notre Dame students violently clashed with the anti-Catholic Ku Klux Klan in that year. A weekend of riots drove the Klan out of South Bend and helped bring an end to its rising power in Indiana, at a time when the state's governor was among its members. Finally, in 1927, University President Father Matthew Walsh decided that the Fighting Irish was preferable to the school's more derisive nicknames. He said in a statement, The university authorities are in no way adverse to the name Fighting Irish, as applied to our athletic teams. I sincerely hope that we may always be worthy of the ideal embodied in the term Fighting Irish. Today, Notre Dame has the Keogh Norton Institute for Irish Studies, with distinguished scholars of Irish language, literature, history and society. Notre Dame has an international study programme in Ireland, and the campus is the largest centre for the study of the Irish language outside Ireland. Above all, Notre Dame was shaped, and is still influenced by the resilience and deep thirst for learning of the Irish people. That ideal was eloquently described by Ireland's President Mary McAleese at Notre Dame's commencement in 2006. That language that you use here, the fighting Irish, we don't mean fighting in the sense of argumentative, though we might occasionally mean argumentative. <laughs> but what we actually mean mostly when we talk about it is an indomitable spirit, a commitment, never tentative, always fully committed total commitment to life itself, no matter what life threw at them, and it threw quite a few wobblies at the Irish from time to time. That indomitable spirit that always sought to dig, dig deep, to find the courage to transcend, to keep going. Written by Brendan O'Shaughnessy, read by Brian O'Connor. This podcast was produced by Notre Dame Stories. Much of the music is by Alex Mansour. The Irish song, The Easter Snow, was arranged by Mark Redman and performed by the Newman Vocari Ensemble in Dublin. It is courtesy of GIA Publications.